Well, congratulations. We've taken the whole journey through the gut, but it's time for us to take a side journey here into the brain. The gut-brain axis dominated the last 10 years of science as far as a completely new paradigm, new field of research, everything else. Between 2000 and 2010, we learned more about the brain than we had ever in history combined. It was an extraordinary explosion of understanding the structure of neurons, the anatomy of the brain, and ultimately the, the biophysical and me metabolic function of the brain when it's going through different processes in the day from eating to breathing to waking and sleeping. We, we learned so much about this extraordinary central processing unit of the human brain. But as I've pointed out in the small intestine section, the brain is not what initiates thought. The brain is that central processing unit that would be in your Intel processor in your laptop. But as we've mentioned, the Intel processor has never written a term paper. All the brain is doing is taking in information, organizing it into patterns, and then putting it back out. Ultimately, the information that would come to that brain to begin that organization process is one that begins in this biologic environment of the gut. And I find it just truly fascinating that here we emerge as mammals and ultimately humans some 200,000 years ago when biology has been producing the information that has allowed for the emergence of the genetic and biodiverse flora, fauna, and beyond in this planet for 4 billion years. So we just barely showed up on the scene. And we showed up at the moment that there was enough biodiversity, specifically within the bowels and the colon ultimately of the human to allow us to take in more information than any biologic creature on the planet ever had. I find it truly fascinating. Go jump back to the colon section if you wanna blow your mind again. It is truly fascinating that the, the density of biodiversity within the colon is logarithmically higher than anywhere else found in nature. And as we start to understand this gut-brain axis, we do get a glimpse of the possibility that our intelligence as a species, our capacity to co-create our environment with our nature, comes down to the sheer amount of information that we can glean from these incredible microbes within us. Over the last 10 years, our laboratory has been diving deep into this new science of understanding how all of this information that's available in the microbiome is transmitted. And what we've discovered is that much of this is done through a wireless communication network of small carbon molecules that are made by each species of bacteria, fungi, protozoa, and the like. These small carbon molecules line up within water systems to create a liquid circuit board in which electrical information can transit very rapidly in millionth of a second over great distances at the biologic level. In this way, these carbon networks of information carriage that the bacteria and fungi of your gut are producing mimic the behavior of mycelium in big soil systems. The mycelium function as fiber optic cables, but they also move resources and transit, transit those resources across great distances on farms. If you find one area of, of a 2,000 acre farm that's extremely deplete in nutrients, and you give that nutrient back in some other part of the farm, the mycelium will take that opportunity to use that extra resource and move it over to the depleted spot. And so the mycelium have this brilliant ability to understand its environment, react to the environment, and distribute information and resources across the space and time. In your gut, this becomes very critical, this information transfer across spaces, because there's different areas of your small intestine and ultimately your colon that are very specific to the absorption of these micronutrients as they appear in your food as they pass through the digestive process. And it may be critical for some elements within that nutrition to absorb a centimeter away from where it currently is. And I believe that what we see happening in this carbon matrix that is made by the bacteria and fungi is not only the transfer of information of here's low area of, of nutrient delivery in the gut, here's a high area, there's also ability for these carbon networks to actually move the elements of the compost of your food from place to place around the intestines to maximize absorption. And so as you start to lose microbiome diversity, you start to lose some of this communication network. You lose the biodiversity of these carbon 
snowflakes, each species making its own contributions in shape, size, and function within this wireless communication network. And so a drop in microbiome leads to a drop, drop in information transfer, a drop in resource management and movement, and therefore a loss of that bioavailability of your food. And so as we start to consider a chemical industry of food systems that are viewed with antibiotic residues from herbicides, pesticides, and the actual antibiotics in the meat and things like that, we, we run into this issue of a, a collapse of the ecosystem within us. And we immediately compound the problem that we had in the food in the first place is that those chemically grown foods that are devoid of many of the micronutrients necessary for the medicine within the food, the fragrance of the food, the taste of the food, the pleasure of the food that was going to ignite your life, with all of that missing, you compound that when the, the microbial communication network goes down. And so what we have found is that as we start to supplement back these wireless communication networks into human gut or animals, we immediately see an improvement of the vitality within that animal. In a growing animal or, or young human, we can actually see better growth patterns. We can see better utilization of a, a day's food in, into lean muscle and skeletal mass and the like. And so this, this improved bioavailability of food by giving back the communication network is demonstrating the power of this wireless network and this kind of liquid circuit board type environment across the gut lining produced by your bacteria and fungi. But it goes far beyond the gut lining. We've now done studies where we grow the intestines on one level of the petri dish and the blood brain barrier above that. And we've been able to demonstrate that the loss of this communication network at the gut leads to the same vulnerabilities at the blood brain barrier as we see at the gut. And these vulnerabilities tend to be a breakdown in the tight junctions, the Velcro that holds these huge barrier systems that contain billions of cells body wide to produce these protective barriers. With the loss of that communication network at both the gut and the blood brain barrier, we become vulnerable to high permeability or leak across these systems. The classic leaky gut is actually symptomatic, not at the gut level as much as at the brain level. If you look up the symptoms of leaky gut, the top five have four that are related to the brain function rather than to your gut. One of them is bloating, which we will give to the gut there, but the other ones, brain fog, poor sleep quality, poor concentration, headaches, all of those symptomatic of this gut-brain connection in their vulnerabilities to the environment. The primary compounds within our food that drive leaky gut and subsequently then leaky brain are going to be glyphosate, a common herbicide in there, as in addition things like alcohol. The reason why alcohol gives you a hangover and all of that is because it's dehydrating the brain as you lose the integrity of the gut lining and then the blood-brain barrier and water no longer transits correctly across there. So one of the big reasons for that is that tight junction damage that is inherent to alcohol. Other things to look out in this kind of natural health world that I see now becoming rampant in children and teens is overconsumption of kombucha, which can have low levels of alcohol in there combined with high sugar content. Alcohol with sugar content gives both an antimicrobial effect and a injury to the tight junction, but also leaves behind this shift in the biome, this dysbiosis that will make those kids prone to inflammation. So a lot of the commercial kombuchas on the market leave high sugar residues and have enough alcohol in there to have a bit of a sterilizing effect on their gut. So if kombucha, do it infrequently. It is not like sauerkraut and these other compounds that, that do not have alcohol in them. And so I'd rather have you on a bacterial ferment like your sauerkraut than kind of that fungal uh, element that you would find in something like a kombucha. And so we want to watch out for those alcohol exposures. As mentioned in the mouth section, the alcohol-containing mouth, mouthwashes are also a, a considerable problem with loss of microbiome up top, and if you end up swallowing that, down through the body. So watch out for the antimicrobial compounds in the diet and, and push for those. Cinnamon, mint, and some of those you know, potent antimicrobials up top, including the ones that are often used as kind of a medicinal protectant, uh, as an antimicrobial that I see used in the kind of herbal and, and holistic health models that I think are concerning are the overuse of oregano oil, as well as things like golden seal. So we need to get away from the mentality of killing bacteria and start to understand the importance of fostering diverse microbiome. So in that effort, 
nutritional changes that are going to be beneficial have been mentioned throughout this whole journey of the gut, but they really apply to the brain. High fiber diets are always going to be better than a high protein diet for that gut. Throughout the course, we've been talking about the importance of nutrition and getting back into kind of the relationship to the soil to maximize microbial stability and biodiversity within the body. And I really want to bring attention to the brain now in regards to that nutrition because too often we walk around with complaints of brain fog, poor sleep quality, short-term memory loss, all of these issues, and we keep thinking we've got a brain issue. And, and I want you to know that if you have any neurologic symptom, it is going to find its foundation in the gut. So I want you to really short, short jump to the solution here. If you've got any issues of, of these you know, poor sleep, poor concentration, et cetera, your first thought, all right, what do I need to do to my diet to really get there? And by improving the diet, you'll ha have a, a huge impact on quality of sleep almost immediate. And so the components, again, that you're going to want to look to, perhaps in the context for with an Ayurvedic nutritionist or at least an Ayurvedic survey fill out online, you're going to benefit from those high fiber, high complexity carbohydrate diets that are going to deliver the maximum amount of anti-inflammatories and other medicines within the food, as well as the, the micronutrients critical for neurologic function. The fiber rich, high complex carbohydrate and high variety of those carbohydrates being a critical piece of the puzzle. This would include things like grains, legumes, greens, fruits, vegetables, go across the whole, whole effort there to, to really dive deep into as much color on the plate, as much scent and nuance of, of the flavors and scents that you're getting in that food to really support brain health optimally. The reason why that's so critical ultimately is because as you diversify the food and diversify the bacteria that they then would consume that food, we get a better interplay with the neurologic system within that gut lining. It is remarkable to remember that the gut contains more neurons than the brain of a dog. It is an extraordinary neurologic center that focuses its expression and its listening, if you will, to that you know, half of a hair width of membrane that we call the epithelial lining of your gut, covering two tennis courts in surface area this brain distributes itself out to every millimeter of that surface to listen carefully to the environment and interestingly to also talk to the environment. And so we find that human neurologic stressors can actually change the gut microbiome. It does this through a couple of different pathways, but I'm most fascinated by what I think will emerge in this next 10 years as a big new science is the ways in which our brain talks directly to those bacteria through the transitive neurotransmitters. But right now where we're at in the science is understanding how the bacteria go the other direction to make our, our brain uh, flush with its opportunity for communication. And it does this by interacting with the enteric endocrine cells in the gut lining. As much as 10% of the billions of cells that lie in your gut to create that protective and absorptive beha behavior of the small intestine and the colon and beyond, 10% are these enteric endocrine cells that don't participate in nutrient absorption or anything else, but instead they are the factories for neurotransmitters. More than 90% of the serotonin in the body are established here in these enteric endocrine cells of your gut. And as mentioned before, you, the, you need the right bacteria to be present on top of those enteric endocrine cells in order for them to do their work. And so there's this beautiful interplay of the gardener, which are the bacteria. I feel the like bacteria are gardening the soil of your gut, delivering nutrients directly to that, that specific enteric endocrine cell so that it can build something as complex as the molecule of serotonin. Serotonin takes many metabolic steps of biochemical inputs to finish neurotransmitter. And it takes this participation of the, that active gardener, that bacteria floating around in the gut lining to do the work to to nurture the soils and then walk over, harvest some nutrient and deliver it there into the bucket of the enteric endocrine cell. Deeper than that then is this extraordinary phenomenon that was just demonstrated at UCSF is that there's a direct interface of the afferent nerves that are now sticking their, their prong-like structures of the neural sensory system out past the gut membrane to mix directly with the bacteria. And they've now been able to image the process of bacteria re releasing to these nerves the, the neurotransmitter precursors that will then become serotonin or dopamine in the body. It's such an eloquent thing to see this happen because the bacteria actually use the same vacuole 
release of these precursors of neurotransmitters that the neuron will then use to release serotonin into the synapse in your brain to create the experience of sensory processing or dopamine, creating the sensory experience of pleasure. And so it's beautiful that we have this biomimicry be between the behavior of a bacteria at the gut lining and the neurons transmitting the information back and forth across the, the, the brain. And so I love this eloquent dance that we have in biology where the gardeners of our gut delivering these nutrients to our body start to demonstrate to the biology of a mammal how communication is done. And so what I've covered so far is two massive methods that the microbiome produces to allow for information transfer throughout the, this thing that we call nature. The first is these tiny carbon molecules, each species contributing 10 or 15 variants, the whole microbiome at large creating this massive circuit board of these carbon matrices. That's the wireless communication network, it passes electrical information around. Then it contributes to this management of the production of neurotransmitters that allow electricity to pulse through a neuron and then transfer information via the neurotransmitters uh, that we would see present in the brain and peripheral nervous systems. It's the microbiome fundamental in your peripheral and central nervous system function, central to your mood stability, central to your executive function and memory, central to your capacity for a good sleep quality, good sex drive, all of these critical neurologic and neuroendocrine effects of the body are gonna tie back to this beautiful relationship between the gut brain of the microbiome, the wall of the intestine, and this extraordinary system of peripheral nervous system into that central processing unit of the brain and flowing back down again. So what happens when we start to see a loss of the, this microbial workforce that's doing the carbon matrix in the wireless communication network, as well as this stimulation to our neurotransmitter base. The first symptoms tend to be that of a loss of sensory processing. This is a drop in serotonin and other neurotransmitters within the brain. But with that drop in neurotransmitter reservoir, due to a loss of that microbial diversity and abundance within the gut, we start to see the inability to take in all of the cacophony of information that's coming from our our hearing, our sight, our taste, the whole matrix that we're going through in the day, and then making sense of it. And for this, we see the emergence, right as we created this, this advent of GMO and you know, Roundup Ready crops, and we started introducing these herbicides at record levels into our food system, destroying the microbiome of the soils, and ultimately our gut, and losing that whole workforce, and therefore the communication network of our human body in the process, we see the emergence of attention deficit disorder, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder as another nuance of that, and then ultimately our autism spectrum disorder. Glyphosate was patented as an herbicide weed killer in 1974 and really went on the market seriously in 1976. By the late 1980s, we were starting to see a, a sudden emergence or acceleration of, of the appearance of autism spectrum disorders but it would not do the hockey stick elevation until the late 1990s, just a couple years after the debut of the GMO, Roundup Ready corn, soybean, et cetera, when we started spraying these crops, these commodity crops, including wheat, directly with this compound, we saw the hockey stick, that logarithmic vertical curve happen in the prevalence of autism. In 1974, before the advent of this chemical agriculture that was destroying this work system of the microbes within our soils and guts, we had one in 5,000 children in the United States with autism. By the late 1990s, we were seeing numbers that were more like one in 200. By the late 2000s, we were seeing one in 88, 2010, 2011. That then doubled in the next four years to one in 44. We haven't seen the most recent numbers, but we suspect that the numbers are currently down around one in 28, one in 30 children now with autism. Compare that to one in 5,000, just a generation back. And so we have seen this devastating effect on sensory processing in our children and in our adults over that short period of time. Sensory processing deficits that occur later in life not on the developing brain that would, would present itself with attention deficit, hyperactivity, or autism spectrum, would be presenting as dementias. The inability for that executive function, that transfer of information between short-term memory to long-term memory. And so we get the dementia 
effect taking off at the same time as the autism hockey stick right in the late 1990s there with Alzheimer's in women and Parkinson's in men. And so their neurodegenerative and executive loss of memory in those two conditions, which interestingly does seem to be hormone sensitive. And so with a high testosterone environment of the male biology, you, you tend to go towards Parkinson's. And with the high estrogen state of the female biology, you tend to go towards the Alzheimer's phenomenon. In the end, we see both autism, Alzheimer's, and Parkinson's taking off into this logarithmic chronic disease epidemic at the exact same time in history. And the underpinning of that lies here in the gut-brain axis. Loss of the, the soil biology, loss of the microbiologic diversity there led to nutrient deficiencies within our food. The chemical residues of that same antibiotic glyphosate within our food and the loss of the nutrients within our food led to a loss of biodiversity within our guts. And for that, loss of communication network of the wireless carbon network, as well as a decreased workforce to produce the serotonin and dopamine that our bodies would use, we find ourselves in today's condition. And unfortunately, those are really the tip of the iceberg. The autism spectrum to the Alzheimer's dementia still affect a relatively small part of the population. But what we're seeing dominant in almost 50% of the population are the more subtle neurosensory deficits. The leading of these is sleep disorder. And so nuanced changes in the hormonal environment and communication network of neurotransmitters on the effect of the brain and its relationship to sleep is profoundly rampant because of the comp complexity of sleep. To initiate sleep is one of the most complicated neurologic events that will happen in a human body. Imagine taking this busy brain and shutting down all the right parts such that you become un subconscious in, in your behavior. You've shut down your conscious brain. You're now in the subconscious realm. You've frozen muscular response so that you don't act out your dreams. You've changed your biologic transfer of metabolism from muscle delivery to brain delivery during sleep. You've changed the entire electrical and energetic patterns of electricity as they run through the brain at night. It's an extraordinarily complicated phenomenon to create a good night's sleep. And so as we undermine this workforce of the microbiome, and we start to destroy that barrier system of the gut epithelium and ultimately the blood-brain barrier, causing inflammatory reactions at all of those levels, we are very likely to perturb that sleep quality. So in the end, I'm not sure any of us living in Western civilization countries actually know what a good night's sleep feels like. I think all of us have some degree of sleep dysfunction, even subclinical, where we think, oh yeah, I had a good night's sleep. But in the end, to really get into that deep rhythm of not just REM sleep and things like that that you'd pick up on your aura ring, but how much are you actually getting of the energetic restoration What's the effect of the, the accumulation of not just theta waves and things like that, but the energy that would r run through your, your, your distal meridian system of the body, resetting the electrical grid, remembering your original math within that physics environment of the ethereal light system of the body. We are really on the brink of collapse here as a species. We now have one in three males infertile due to their sperm counts. We've got one in three females infertile due to loss of ovarian function, endocrine and metabolic collapse. So we're failing to reproduce as a species. Ultimately, this collapse of fertility is yet another downstream symptom of brain dysfunction. The pituitary gland sits at the base of the brain and is called the master gland, and it regulates the function of the thyroid, the adrenal glands, and the gonads, the ovary and the testes. And this master gland is regulating the amount of hormonal capacity for, for reproduction from a, on a day-to-day -day basis. And so as we see a massive collapse in uh, sexual function and, and reproductive capacity as we're seeing currently, we can always map that back to this gut workforce and the microbiome and its diversity or the lack thereof. And so when we start talking about the gut-brain axis, it is not just fundamental to, do I remember where my keys put, it's literally talking about the survival of our species. So it's absolutely critical for all of us to start to embrace a lifestyle that understands the relationship of soil systems to food systems, to the soil of our gut, to health and integrity and communication across our gut lining, to ultimately the manifestation 
of clear thought and clear neurologic and endocrine function downstream of that. We have a huge opportunity to integrate back into nature. I touched on it briefly, but I do want to circle back to the, the, the reality that is starting to emerge is that our stress as a species creates dysbiosis. It also has been shown recently to create leaky gut. And so an increase in cortisol, which is a stress hormone that can be normal to our day, where it surges in the morning and then tapers throughout the day as a, a potent regulator of inflammation pathways, modulates the immune system, and all these critical paths, but then acute stressors that, that are, are pathologic to us create rather the, than this nice wave or curve that floats through the day, these spikes of cortisol. And these spikes of cortisol have now been shown to damage the tight junctions of the gut lining, leaving us with that leaky gut phenomenon, but also induce a change in the balance of the ecosystem within us. And so I find this fascinating. You might be doing everything right in your diet. You've done the Ayurvedic nutrition consult. You've changed your grocery shopping. You've eliminated all your processed sugars, eating a ton of fiber, and you find yourself with bloating and dysbiosis and all that. This is when I start to refer my patients to emotion code therapy or NEAT or NET, any of these emotion detox pathways and techniques that have been developed become a big tool. Because ultimately, if we don't eliminate your cognitive and emotional stress, we may never reach balanced microbiome systems within your gut. Furthermore, we may never reach the complete reversal of that leaky gut syndrome. And so it's time for us to really buckle down and co-create a, a garden of balance within us that would then feed and nurture our brains into a thriving state over the course of our lives. So engage in nature, enjoy that food, get that medicinal and anti-anxiety, anti-depressant effect of the taste before you even swallow it, and then enjoy the, the co-creation of this diverse ecosystem within you and what that can nourish you back into as it tends to the lining of your gut and brain access.